Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to Madison's Midweek Bible Study. We've been talking about prayer. That's our topic. So we've spent the last two weeks in Matthew and Luke looking at the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to kind of continue uh, with the passages, verses right after that in Luke. I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, before we do, I like, if those of you who know me know I like having everything planned and, and uh, uh, laid out. So I want to sh share with you what we're going to be doing through the end of September. So we're going to look at these five prayers. That way you guys can look ahead. I'll post it on the Facebook page. But one of the things that's unique is each one of these, each one of these prayers kind of has a different purpose. There are prayers for asking God forgiveness. There's prayers for when we feel overwhelmed. Uh, there's prayers for encouragement to others. And so this is what we're going to do through the end of September. Uh, and then in October, uh, we're actually going to... Uh, address kind of the elephant that's always in the room when we talk about prayer, and that is how do we pray when, when to get our prayers answered if our prayers aren't answered. Uh, so we're going to tackle that tough topic in October. So what we're going to do tonight is in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, they, Jesus' disciples once again asks him, ask him how to pray. So he gives him a shorter version of the Lord's Prayer than what we saw in Matthew. But what we see in Luke, beginning in verse 5, is he gives a parable. And then he has several verses uh, all the way to 13. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. So even though it's not a prayer, it follows the Lord's Prayer. And the parable is, uh, gives us some additional information on, uh, on prayer. So we're going to start with Luke chapter 11, and then we're beginning with verse 5. So we'll make sure this works. He said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you? If his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? All right, so let's talk about the parable. Or let's start off with the, with the parable. So... What's the, what's the one thing that you notice or what's the one thing that kind of struck you either when you heard it or if you got a chance to read it ahead of time about the parable itself? Why did the friend finally come and open the door? Because he was persistent. He didn't give up. Even though he got rejected seemingly time and time again, he kept asking. What's really interesting is in the English Standard Version and then what you guys heard, right? You see this word impudence. But if you look at all, if you look at several or if you look at a lot of different translations, uh, what you'll notice is look how it's translated in all the various versions, which is correct. But the translation is that he boldly went without any shame. So this parable, when Jesus told this parable, probably those who heard it found it fairly amusing because it's very much based on the Jewish culture and it's like one of those sitcoms that we watch where if anything can go wrong, it goes wrong. So for example, in the Jewish culture, right? Two things. First of all, as a Jew, I would want to make sure I was a good friend and good neighbor as long as that friend and that neighbor was Jewish. And so going to going to that house at midnight 
was a very difficult thing for, them to, for him to do because that was against the culture. The other thing that was very culturally important is you had to be a good host, right? You had to be hospitable. You had to show that. So suddenly this guy shows up at midnight at his house. The other thing is, you know, for us, midnight, we think at midnight, well, that's not that late. Although as you get older, midnight seems to get a lot later. Now, some, now some of y'all, midnight's not that late yet, but for, I'm getting where it is. But for us, this would be more like two or three in the morning, right? So he shows up at his house, which that in itself was a faux pas because you didn't show, it some, you didn't show up at someone's house that late, right? And so it all kind of just starts all going against everything that the Jews uh, thought of, right? A couple of things, though, just to kind of point out, is that what drove, what drove him to his neighbor was necessity, okay? Uh, if he had woken up hungry himself, he, he would have never gone to his neighbor's house at midnight. But it was out of necessity uh, that he does that. When we pray boldly, oftentimes it's out of necessity, right? It's there's something going on in our lives that requires us right then to stop whatever we're doing and to pray. The greater the need, the bolder we get in coming to God. Good point. The do you hear? So the greater the need, oftentimes the bolder that we get. Uh, the other thing that strikes me about the parable, right, is the need wasn't for him, but rather the need was for someone else. He wasn't going to the neighbor for his need, but rather he was going to the neighbor because someone came and, and that was for them. And so when we think about, when we think about prayer, right, when we, when we boldly go before God, it's not just at times for our needs, but it also is oftentimes uh, when we want to uh, pray for others and intercede for others and offer prayers up for others, right? And so uh, that friend's boldness, the whole idea of that boldness is that he broke what would have been cultural. He wound up going to that neighbor's house even though it was late uh, and it was at a very awkward or late time, uh, but he went anyway. Why won't the neighbor get out of bed at first? And a lot of this also has to deal with the culture and the time of the day. But what, what, what reason does he give for not coming to the door? Kids, right? So let's picture what's going on in his house. It's a one-room house. Everybody sleeps in the same bed. Kids are in the middle. Parents are to the outside. Doors don't have hinges. So doors have to be lifted in place and then the iron ring drops down a bar to keep the door in place. If he had any livestock, that was in the house. So he's all settled in. And if he gets up, right? If he gets up, the kids are going to wake up, the lambs and the the animals are going to start waking up. If he opens the door, there's a good chance he's going to open up the, wake up the neighbors. And so suddenly now he's like, he's going to be the one that's not going to be a good neighbor, right? So at first, no, we're, we're all in bed. Everybody's tucked in, uh, things like that. And I think this is important for the parable. What ultimately made him get up and open the door for this neighbor? Was it, was it because he was a, the, a friend of the neighbor or he was a neighbor? But ultimately, what was the reasoning that he opened the door to that neighbor? Exactly. <laughs> he just, I couldn't take it anymore. Go away and let me go back to sleep, right? It wasn't because, and so Jesus says, it's not because he was a friend that he did that for him, but rather because of this shameless or this impudence or whatever these are, are referred to. So, uh, I'll just go ahead and build it out. Cause. So, let's talk about the meaning of the parable. So, this is referred to, we often talk about this being a how much more parable. Meaning that we make an argument 
to go from the lesser to the greater. You know, I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, it's pretty interesting. What? Well, and you guys ignore that. You like act like you can't see the last line. <laughs> but what? What's because I think this. I think if you go to Google, remember we talked about the first one. That's very important. We write our own observations. We make our own interpretations, and we do our own applications before we start looking at commentaries or googling things. Because if you go to Google and you Google the meaning of, this par meaning of this parable, most of the responses you get are incorrect. So what's the, what's the point that Jesus is trying to make with this parable, knowing that it is a how much more parable? And don't look at the answer. But what do you think? Keep asking. What else? Okay. All right. Any other thoughts? Oh, there are some things I don't really want to ask him because it seems, you know, so trivial. It's like I don't want to bother him with that, and it almost seems like part of what you're trying to get at is so we shouldn't worry about what it is that we're asking. We can ask it anyway. He's the all-powerful God. He's the sovereign God. And he can do. So let's talk about those first, right? The first thing that Jesus is trying to get across is you be persistent, right? It doesn't matter the time of day. God's not asleep, right? It doesn't matter time of day. You boldly go. He knows He's going to answer their prayer. The second part, though, is I think what's very important is because what Jesus is trying to tell them, if a human who claims to be a friend is going to wind up and eventually help somebody, God's not going to necessarily... I mean, God's going to do it out of love. God's going to do it out of the feelings he has for you. If, if, if the friend shamelessly or, or if God is more gracious than that neighbor, okay? When you read the Google trans interpretations, oftentimes what they say is if you want something from God, you ask, 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 and eventually God will give it to you just to get rid of you. But that's not the parable that Jesus is saying. What Jesus is trying to say is that if, if we, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but if we, if that neighbor will eventually get up, how much more, right? He's the lesser. How much more will the greater do for you uh, when you come and you ask? Mm -hmm. It also shows us who has we're the ones in need, and God has what we need. Exactly. And he's the provider. And we're going to touch on that. Excellent for giving me my view into the next couple of slides, right? As we go, this is where Jesus reinforces that idea, right? So if we look at verses 9 and 12, we see two distinct thoughts, right? The first thought is that we've got to be constant in our praying, right? If you go back to that interpretation that I talked about on Google where it just says if you just keep asking, I mean, look at Paul. How many times did Paul ask for his thorn to be taken away? He asked for three times. Well, if you interpret the parable, he shouldn't have stopped at three. He should have just kept going, right? So the, the parable is not that you just keep, God's going to grant something just to get rid of you. The th thought is, is that God is so loving, so gracious, He's going, to, he's going to answer that prayer. He's going to give it to you regardless. But we've got to go bold, right? Uh, let's look at the first part. The first part is, and I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be open to you. Uh, she's not here, so I'll talk about her, although she may be watching. My wife's an English teacher. So what's the verbs? What are the verbs that we see in that first part? Ask. Seek and knock. So, and that is a present tense. Now, do you think there's a progression of intensity? What's more intense? Asking or knocking? Knocking, right? Think about your think about those of us who have who have kids uh, when they were young or grandkids when they're young. You know, they'll they'll ask for you. Right? They may be sitting down playing and they don't realize you've left the room. 
and they'll ask, but then when they don't hear you, they'll go find you, right? They'll go seek you. And so it's a, it's a constant or it's a type of uh, progression uh, that, we, that we see. Uh, somebody look up Hebrews 11, uh, 6. Well, actually, somebody just read it really loud because I put it on here. But uh, let's look at uh, Hebrews eleven six. And without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. How does Hebrews 11.6 play into our prayer life? Well, I think it just says basically that you know our prayer to God is not just uh, to get something we want. It's a relationship. And if we don't have faith in God and confidence in Him and trust that He's going to not necessarily give us what we want, to me, that's the ask, seek, and knock. You start asking, and God helps you to understand, and then sometimes you need to seek, and then sometimes you need to knock. But sometimes God gives you what He knows you need rather than what you're asking for. And so to me, that it's more of the relationship. And if you don't have faith in God as that other person, figure, or being, whatever you want to call him. He's my daddy, but anyway, <laughs> you know, if you don't see him that way and respond to him in that way, then he's not going to be able to really help you because you're you're not going to have the faith to receive what he gives you anyway. In, in a minute, we're going to talk about the second half, right? But it talks about a father-son, right? It talks about that relationship that the son can ask the father. Right. And if you have a good relationship, for example, I can ask my dad anything. Right. So if you have a good relationship, you can ask that person anything. And so the first, I think with Hebrews six, we first got to realize we've got that relationship that we've got to build, but it's built on on faith. Uh, and I think we have to ask ourselves these questions. So. If is. Is what you pray for, if you think about your prayer life, are the things that you're most passionately and persisting, persistently asking for, do they reflect what God is most concerned about? Right? The things that you're praying for, do they reflect what God's most uh, concerned about? Because it kind of goes back to His will, right? And then... So I'm, I'm very, uh, I've been reading a couple of books on spiritual growth, so you guys are going to get that a lot because I'm like that. But if, are we persistent? Does our prayers include us growing spiritually and others growing spiritually? Do we include those in our prayers, right? If we, if we took these things into account and we prayed based upon the pattern that's given to us, Imagine the wonderful things that would happen, right? So let's go to the second part. So the second part is that we got to be confident. What this is telling us is we got to be confident when we pray. If we look at, uh, first of all, will God answer, this is true or false, will God answer any and all prayers in the way that we desire? No. Would He... Uh, will He give us anything we ask as long as we just keep asking? No. So let's go back and think about uh, you know, what we read in Matthew 6.10 and Luke 11.2, which is the Lord's Prayer, I forgot to have a point, is that God's will and glory should be front and center whenever we pray. Okay? Uh, and we've got to be confident that God's going to answer our prayers in a manner that's best for us. Let's go back and look at verse. Uh, let's go uh, look at verse eleven. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, 
will give him a scorpion. If you then are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So let's look at that first part, right? Now, if we look at Matthew's account, Matthew also adds, if a son asks for bread, what father would give him a stone? So you've got a child who's asking for fish, asking for an egg, and in Matthew's asking a, for bread. So what is the basic need of the child? Nourishment. They're hungry, right? So in their hunger, they're asking for food. And it says the Father will give them that. I think one of the things that this parable teaches us is that God will give us uh, that basic need. Now, will He actually give us... How do we resolve a kid's hunger? Is it more than just a fish, egg, or bread? Right? Uh, a young child, you know, when, when my son was young, and he says, Dad, I'm hungry. Well, son, what do you want? Ice cream. Cookies. Hall Halloween candy, right? When you ask a child who's hungry what they want, who knows best what that child needs? The child or the parent? And so I think one of the things this tells us is that this child has a basic need and a human father isn't going to ignore that need. The human father is going to give that child something to eat. And so therefore, if the Heavenly Father, uh, if the Heavenly Father will do that, how much more will God provide for us? Let's take a look at a couple of scriptures. Uh, James 1, 5, and 6. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like, is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Anybody been on a boat when it's been rough? So I think I told you my first job out of college, I worked for the Navy. And so we were in uh, at Stennis Space Center near Slidell, Louisiana. So uh, there were white, there's white ships and gray ships. Uh, gray ships are wartime vessels or war vessels. White ships are research vessels. So if there was a tropical storm or hurricane in Gulf of Mexico, we would have to take the white ships out and ride at sea, right? So I've been through a couple of hurricanes, tropical storms, when it's been uh, tossed back and forth by the wind, right? You don't want to do that. But we can't doubt, right? That, that verse is to say we've got to boldly ask, We've got to ask with confidence, and we've got to ask knowing that God can answer. Now, is it going to be what the answer we want, or is it going to be uh, that? We don't know, but we ask confidently uh, and constantly. James 4, 2-3, two, four, two you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. I think this goes back to what Miss Gale says is, you know, sometimes we get caught up in this prosperity gospel. You guys been on Facebook, type amen and you'll be given cash or type amen and you'll get this new car, right? We have this idea, this pr uh, prosperity gospel, but James tells us that we ask and sometimes we don't receive because we're asking because we're to spend it on our passions. When Jesus is pattern prayer tells us everything should be asked in the will of God. That His will should be foremost, right? Uh, 1 John 5, 14, uh, 15. And this is the confidence that we have toward Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of Him. Okay, when you read that verse... Is there one thing that just kind of jumps out at you for a minute? According to His will. According to his will right? So whatever you ask, according to His will, He hears. So what's the implication there? Are there times when He doesn't hear us? He doesn't. He hears us but He doesn't necessarily respond if what? If we're praying 
outside or not according to His will. That goes back up to here where we're doing it based upon our passions. Yep. And to me, that is a much more humbling thing uh, to say that God tells me no than it is to say, well, he just didn't do anything. Yep. Well, in my life, I feel like sometimes in those kind of situations that I've prayed for the wrong thing or not, you know, what, whatever, it, it's more like instead of him just saying no to me, I, I can look back now. I couldn't see it so closely then. But it's like his hand helping me to understand, to move me into his will. You know what I'm saying? He doesn't just say no and forget about it. If it's something that will help you to grow, then he helps you to move and to grow into his will. And I, I think he does that providentially with a lot of things that we pray about. I think if for those of you who weren't here the first class, right? In the first class, the scripture tells us that we can know God's will. Not all of God's will, but like, for example, we looked at scriptures that said, you know, God's will is that all men be saved. God's will was that Jesus died on the cross. So we've got, you know, if you ever get a chance, do a word study on will, and you'll see some of the things that are God's will. And so when we pray, if we want to ensure that He hears us, we must go back to that pattern and pray in according to His will. me in the future or for my life in the future. But I guess the one consolation to me is that his own son in the garden prayed just before his arrest and crucifixion. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Um, nevertheless, uh, my will be sure to be done. And we know what God's will was for Jesus to go to the cross. My, my struggle is, I don't know what his will is for me in the future. And I, and I think, yes, that's where I've got to learn to trust him. And that's what I struggle with. And I think it goes back to that the child asking for something to eat. We may want chicken fingers, but there's no guarantee God's going to give us chicken fingers. We, we just have to have faith that he'll give us what we, what we need, right? Or answer us. In a way that's best for us, and I think that's the struggle. One of the, uh, one of the greatest lessons I guess I've ever learned was from a lady that's over in Arkansas. She lost her husband. She had a daughter that was graduating from high school. She, her husband, because of technicalities, left. There was nothing from no pension for her, and so we asked her, you know, what are you going to do? What? What are your plans? What are your thoughts? And she basically said, I don't have to know. God knows. I just got to trust God. And, and when I think about that and I think about my prayer life, and I know that God desires that I bring my needs to Him. I have no doubt about that. And I, I know that God knows what my needs are, my true needs. Not just what I'm asking for, but my true needs. And I know that God has the ability to accomplish those needs. And so it goes back for me to, to trusting in Him because of who He is. And I don't have to know. And, and I hope, I know my plan for the last class here is that we kind of make a prayer plan. And, and I'm, you guys write down some specifics of people or things you want to pray for. And I'm hoping in that last October class, we might share some things because I think one way that helps us build up that faith and that prayer is to hear how God's answered others' prayer. Vic, did you have a... All right, because I got to get through this part because uh, unless somebody knows the answer, then we can skip it, right? So in Luke, right, th if we look at the last verse of this passage, it says, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. If we read the same thought in Matthew, Matthew says, uh, your Father who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask Him. So when you look at Matthew, it looks like it's real big, real broad. But then when you look at Luke, it looks very 
specific, very narrow. Okay, so we're, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, and uh, we'll do the disclaimer again. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, but any thoughts of how the Holy Spirit fits in? Because if you do, then you save me from going through some slides. But uh, our, excellent. That's one of the scriptures we have. So what we're going to do is we're going to have I got four slides that will explain the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's let's start off with the Old Testament because oftentimes we think of the Holy Spirit as being something that's New Testament only. But the Jews were very familiar with the Holy Spirit from the Old Testament. They knew that the Spirit granted special skills. In Exodus chapter 31, God tells Moses as he's about to start the tabernacle that he's going to put the Spirit into certain men so they know how to do metallurgy, they know how to blend gold and silver, they know how to carve rocks, to give them that special knowledge, right? They also knew that the Spirit came upon judges and kings. First Samuel, when Saul was made king, he was filled with the Spirit. The first judge, Othaniel, was filled with the Spirit. They also knew that the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit came for power and prophecy. Moses chose 70 men to be elders, and for a short time they were filled with the Spirit so they could prophesy. Okay, so they knew... The Holy Spirit was at work at times in the Old Testament. However, they also had prophecies that told them that when the Messiah came, the Holy Spirit would be poured out onto the kingdom. So Isaiah 61 actually introduces the Messiah by saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. Joel 2, 28 and 29 says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, even on the male and female servants of those days. If we go to Acts chapter 2, when the apostles are accused of being drunk, Peter stands up and says, we're not drunk, it's too early in the day. And then he quotes Joel 2, 28 and 29. They knew that the Holy Spirit was going to come in fullness, right? If we look at Ezekiel 36, it says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. That's a prophecy of the new covenant that was established. The Jews had this. They had the knowledge of the, how he worked. They also had the prophecies. That's why, my opinion, is... In John chapter 3, verse 2, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, Nicodemus hadn't put everything together yet, but he had enough of the jigsaw puzzle put together that he was starting to get some type of picture. Because Nicodemus says, no one can do what you do unless God is with or unless God is within him. Right. So the Old Testament, they had this. They had the works, they had the prophecies. So let's move to the New Testament. By no means all the verses in the New Testament about the Holy Spirit, but let's look at a couple. For we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us or given us by God. Ephesians 1.13 In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. For in one Spirit we're all baptized in the one body, Jew or Greek, slave or free, and we're all made to drink one Spirit. Or do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. Galatians 5.16, but I say walk by the Spirit and you'll be gratif not gratify the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit. Notice it doesn't say fruit of the spirits. The fruit of the Spirit, one Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. But we, we always give thanks to God 
for, bro for you, brothers, by the beloved Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, uh, who is the Spirit. And then finally, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly await for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for hope uh, for what he sees. Okay, so we have all of these verses on the Holy Spirit. So let's go back to the, let's go back to the question. What does God give by giving the Holy Spirit? Is going to be for the overall good of all people. So, when I was a kid, uh, kindergarten, first and second grade, we lived on a farm. Not our farm, but my uncle's farm. And we had livestock. Well, there was one field that we did not have access to unless we got on the road, we went around the corner, past our neighbor's house, and then we'd get to that field. Well, our neighbor, right by the road, had this apple tree that had these best little green apples, right? So when you were five or six-year-old boy, those were the best things ever. And so I would sit on the fender of the tractor. Dad would go around. He'd stop, and he'd let me grab an apple, and I'd eat it. And one time, I remember, he asked me, do I want more apples? And I said, no, I want the whole tree. Bring me the whole tree, right? I think what Jesus means here is that the Holy Spirit, as, as Vic just said, we ask for comfort, and He's given us the Comforter. Okay, Look at Galatians 5.22, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. I am not a patient person. Okay, I pray for patience. God doesn't give me the fruit of patience. He gives me the source of the fruit. Because patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So what, for me, when I look at this verse about good, what's better? What could God possibly give us that's better than the Holy Spirit? Nothing. He's given us everything, right? He's, he's given us, at times in your life, when you are in deep despair, okay, and you pray for joy, if he gave you the fruit, that apple, when I was five years old, that apple lasted four bites and it was gone. But if you pray for joy, he, he doesn't just give you joy. He gives you the source of joy. He's giving you the Holy Spirit, right? If we go to Ephesians 3.20, Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power that's at work within us. I'm going to be the first one to tell you I have more questions than answers about the Holy Spirit. But I know from those verses we looked, it was promised in the Old Testament. It was fulfilled in the New Testament. The New Testament tells us that we are a temple and the Spirit dwells within us. That He's given us this Spirit to help us. Right? You want, you know, you need patience. You know, you're dealing with something and you need patience. He's giving you the source of patience, right? Well, Mike, you use the word source. And to me, the Holy Spirit, it, it, you know, it's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And the Spirit is simply in us. The indwelling, and it's the source of everything that, of the relationship that we have with God and Christ and the Spirit. It's all, He does it all together. <laughs> exactly. You know? and, and I think for me, though, I think what it's telling us is that we ask for the gift and He's given us the giver, right? We ask for the effect and He's given us the cause. He doesn't give us, He doesn't give this to us out of His riches because He is rich, but rather He gives according to His riches, right? 
He gives us, it's like asking for money and somebody giving you the bank. It, he gives us out of his, not out of his extras, right? He didn't give it to us out of his leftovers. He gives us out of his abundance. And I, and I think that's what is, uh, I think that's what's being said here, right? From a, from a children's story, I don't want the golden egg, I want the goose. I think one of the things that's real important that can be missed is the spirit also can redirect our thinking. Because sometimes that's what we need to do, have redirected thinking in our prayer. Maybe we're praying for the wrong thing. I know for uh, me, I tried to have children for 10 years. Could be pregnant. My prayer was, God, please let me get pregnant, you know, for 10 years. And then finally, uh, of course, I was constantly studying God's Word and trying to find out, what am I doing wrong, God? And it just came to me after study and lots of prayer that I'm praying for the wrong thing. And so I finally realized I needed to pray for God and take that desire that was holding me captive away and help me to be at peace, whatever it is that he has for me. And so that just kind of like gave me this peace that I just can't explain. And then I was open to adoption, which was the best thing that happened to us. So, you know, I really think that the Holy Spirit regrets this one, that one of the verses there, it said, ask in whatever we ask for and think that the Spirit and Other comments? Mike, I think it goes back to that idea of being the source, you know, is, is he's the source of that understanding. He's the source of the knowledge that we seek. And, and I think that's a wonderful thing because uh, he acts as that conduit to all those things God has to give us. And uh, we need to look for it. And he redirects that thinking, you know, that, that we have. Uh, because a lot of times we can't see the forest for the trees. And the Holy Spirit many times gives us that clarity of hope. And, and you know, I know uh, you guys heard it before. Heard before. You know, my mom uh, went in for a routine knee replacement. Uh, didn't work. Got med flighted to Nashville was 20 days on a ventilator. I mean, I, I, I didn't know what, I didn't know what to do. And so you, you pray, right? You, you pray for patience. Uh, you pray for strength. And, and I want us to be, I want, I think what I, what I'm trying to make sure we all understand is God will give you that. And he just won't fill your cup up with patience. He just won't fill your cup up with strength. He'll fill it to where it overflows, Right. He'll fill it to where you you have more than what's needed. Yeah, Romans eight twenty three talks about the other direction of that. You know, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit as a giver, but He's also an inter intercessor. And you know, we pray, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us. To Romans two deep the word in the situation you were just talking about. I don't know what to do. Yep. And He's able to interpret that and then give us. More. Well, Mike, I think, too, in that kind of situation, what, what I, I have found that works, and this has been a few times in my life, because of who God is and because of our own weakness, sometimes all we can pray is just hold on to me, God, until I yep. can see what it is that you want me to do. And sometimes that's all we can do. But if we, will, if we will hold on to him, he will never let go of us. Amen. So for next week... 2 Kings 19, uh, 14 through 19. For those of you who are new, the way we learn, the way we study the Bible is we start off writing observations. So read the Scriptures, write down every observation, anything that stands out to you, you write that down as an observation. Then once you do observations, based upon those observations, we then start making interpretations, and then we finally do that application. But you can never have enough observations. Try to fill a page. Anything you observe about that scripture. Uh, 2 Kings 19, uh, 14 through 19. All right. See you next week. Y'all have a good rest of the week.